I just want to say what a delight it is to be part of this church. Um, Paul has asked me to share on the prophetic today. Are we, is the sound okay? Yep. Yep, yep. And I love the prophetic. I'm, I'm passionate about it. I've invested in it. But what I love just as much as the prophetic is seeing people mobilised in the prophetic. That every person is called to be a prophetic believer. And I love seeing people get to a place where they grow in their sensitivity to the voice of God, their awareness of the Holy Spirit, and grow in the depth of wisdom that is required for the blessing for the prophetic to be a blessing. You know, um, this church has an amazing deposit that has already been made in the prophetic. I think the calibre of some of the men and women that come in, have come in here over the years is incredible. And I, and I know, you know, we all get excited when those kind of people come in and, and I think deep down we're all sort of thinking, oh gee, I hope I get a word, I hope I get some ministry. And that's cool and we all love that. But what really excites me is that when God sends in the, the Ephesians for prophets, is the reason that he does that is because they are a gift to the church because what it is that is activated and unlocked in them is what gets activated and unlocked in us. Yeah. And so as we sit there, as we sit in the presence of people that are maybe operating in a realm of something that we're not quite yet operating in, and as we sit there with an open, receptive heart, that gets unlocked in us. And I, I know in my own life, um, there's been occasions, I remember about a year and a half ago, just sitting in a meeting where Izzy did just sin. He was just literally worshipping on the keyboard and um, is, is he just, you know, she operates in this beautiful realm of prophetic poetry and as I was just sitting, listening and, and worshipping, that thing just got unlocked in me, that all of a sudden I just got this download of prophetic poetry and so what I, what I pray today is that anything that I walk in or that's been opened up in me, that, that will be opened up in all of you here. Um, you know, my history is kind of interesting. I wasn't one of these people that was born a prophet. Like, I have a friend who, when she was four years old, she would um, look at people and just know what they were thinking or know what was happening in their life. That, while that would have been really nice, that, that wasn't my journey. I, um, I grew up in a very academic, cerebral world. I grew up in a church, a denomination that didn't believe in the Holy Spirit, it didn't believe in the devil, and it absolutely did not believe in the Holy Spirit gifts. In fact, the only way that you could be saved was by having the correct intellectual doctrine. And emotions were totally disapproved of in church, so as something that was sensationalist. So you, there was a total separation out of anything emotional and your faith. So that, that was my background for 16 years of my life. I had no grid for the prophetic or the Holy Spirit. And then, at 18 years of age, I met this very handsome gentleman here. Yes. And, and I knew, I did, I did. And I knew, for, from the day I met him, I knew that I was going to spend the rest of my life with him. You know, I think there was prophetic stuff happening in me. I just had no grid for it. And so I was a good, you know, feminist university student in those days. And so I figured, well, this is good. You know, I was in a Baptist church by then. I'd, I'd sort of moved. And I'm like, that's cool. He can come to my church half the time and, and I'll go with him half the time. But he's a really stubborn man. And, and so he's like, no, if you want to be with me, you've got to come to my church. So I'm like, really? So, yeah, you know, part of my attitude was a little bit lacking and I was a little bit reluctant, and so I went with him to this church, and I've got to say to you, it was probably the most uncomfortable, freaky thing I've ever done, because I walked into a church where people were flowing in the Holy Spirit, and they did these weird things like speaking in tongues, and I was totally freaked out. But I went along week after week, um, I used to hold his hand and sort of hide behind him from all these scary people. And over time, God started to show me that there was a realm that was deeper than the realm of logic and reason. Yeah, very good. And over the years, I started to let some of my walls down towards the Holy Spirit, started to have some encounters with the Holy Spirit. And then one day, years later, I remember Steve and I went, came out to a church out north uh, with a man named Alan Dunford. And many of you may know him. He's, um, he passed away recently. But he was a very respected leader in this city and, and he, he was a credible, respected, prophetic voice. And I had never had a prophetic word in my life. Um, and so we had lunch with Alan and, and he, he drew me aside after lunch and he said, Alona, I want you to know that there's a prophetic calling on your life. And he said, it's, it's such that you'll be in meetings and the meetings will be here and what you bring will take the meeting to here. And I've got to say, it was a real surprise for me. I didn't actually know what the prophetic was. And it, never, it wasn't even on the radar that I would be prophetic. 
In fact, I actually remember, I don't know if any of you did, you know in the 90s they had those gift quizzes, like what's your spiritual gift? Did any of you do those? Well, we did one of those and, and I actually got zero for the prophetic. Like that was my lowest. And I'm, like, I'm really glad because that's that weird thing that those weird people do. And so so Alan, Alan said this word to me and, you know, it made no sense to my head at all, but there was something that connected with my heart. There was an invitation there from God to go on a journey with him. And I was very, very intentional about pursuing that. You see, the thing about the prophetic is it's not just a gift, it's a lifestyle. Correct. And it's a culture that you get to cultivate in your life. But you need to be really intentional about it. It's not just going to drop out of the sky and fall in your lap. Well, you know, there's probably a handful of people that are like that, but in my experience and for most people I know, it's something that you need to be very, very intentional about cultivating. And so I just, I went after it really intentionally. You're going to hear that word a lot today because <laughs> it's really important. And I, I, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how to be prophetic or how to do it. So I, when people came into town, anyone I knew that had any kind of prophetic gift, I would get with them and say, have coffee with me. And what is this thing? How do I do it? I, I, got, I got hold of every book that I could possibly get hold of. I, I read James Gold and Graham Cook and Chris Vallotton and I... And I, um, I got hold of messages and I listened to them. I did an internet online mentoring thing. You know, I'm just like, God, how do I learn about this thing? And I started to practice. You know, the first time I ever got a prophetic word was in music practice. And I was so scared. It took me four weeks to give the word. And I practiced in music practice and I practiced on the unsaved. And I made a whole lot of mistakes. But I started to learn and I started to grow. And I often laugh because I, 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 you know, so my journey is like I've gone from one extreme to another. I've gone from being totally closed to all of this to so passionate about the prophetic. And I believe that one of the reasons for that journey is that I think one of the calls on my life is actually to mobilise people from wherever it is that you are now, whether you've never really felt like you sense God or whether you feel like you operate in amazing revelatory realms. I just feel that that part of what God wants me to do is, is just help something get mobilised yeah. for the more that God has for every single person here and for this church. You know, the reason that I love the prophetic is because what the prophetic does is it reveals the heart of the Father. Yeah. I love, Graham Cook has this definition and it's simply this, that prophecy is God communicating his heart to his people. And if you remember one thing about the prophetic today, I want you to remember that if you're prophetic, you get to reveal the Father to people. You see, the prophetic is not just about getting information. I mean, I can, you know, it's really impressive if I tell you what you had for dinner last night or what your mother's middle name is or what colour socks you're wearing. And, and I definitely, you know, don't get me wrong, I want to stew the gift so that, so that we can be so accurate in the prophetic. But that is just information and psychics can do that by tapping into the occult power. That is information and it doesn't change lives. Being prophetic means that we get to reveal God to people. We get to show people how God sees them and we get to reveal the destiny that God has assigned for them to walk in so they get to grow into that. You know, I don't know about you, but when I look at things through my natural eyes, I tend to see things, things through lenses of limitation. I can see myself, and I'm aware of all of you. I'm pretty aware of my own areas where I'm a bit broken. I'm pretty aware of my own shortcomings and faults. And probably if I hang around you long enough, I'm going to be aware of yours. And the thing that I love about God is that he sees something really different. And God showed me this picture of, of looking, it just when I was preparing, he said, it's like he looks at people and I saw the silhouette and the silhouette just had all the dirt around. And what God was looking at was this glowing light inside. And I said, God, what is that? And he said, that's what I see. I said, that is who I created you to be. That, that is who I have called you to be. And when God speaks to us, he actually speaks to that potential. He said, this is who you really are. And he, and he calls your true identity to the fore. And that, being prophetic, means that we get to see what it is that God is seeing and we get to speak from that place. That's what Alan did with me. He saw something that I wasn't even aware of, but he saw exactly what God had placed in me. And the minute he spoke it, it released something and activated in my life. 
prophecy brings a revelation of the destiny that is assigned to us by God. And that is something that can only be found in the heart of the Father. You know, when, when God created you, there's a, a conception that happens on a natural level. But God steps in and he creates. And, and he, when he's creating, he is speaking things into your life and he's wiring things into your DNA. Yeah. And what the prophetic does is it goes and finds those things. That God, the words that God spoke over you when he was creating you and he whispers those things that God has already placed into your heart and into your DNA. They're, and the reason that there is such a powerful resonance with the prophetic is you're actually speaking the things, the dreams and the giftings and the desires that God has already placed into your life in seed form. And that is why the prophetic is so powerful. You know, that's, that's what happened with Gideon. Gideon had no clue who he was. He's just sitting there, you know, doing the insignificant thing, hiding away in the wine press. And, and the angel of the Lord comes to him and he says to him, God is with you, mighty man of God, mighty man of God, valiant warrior. You see, what he did, he just, he just hit the nail straight on the head. He said, Gideon, this is who you really are. Yeah. And, and it, didn't, it didn't take a lot of time. There was a little bit of dialogue. But immediately there's something in Gideon because Gideon, actually something shifted in him. And he rose up and something shifted and he actually saved a nation because he realised who he really was. Yeah, I remember praying for a girl a few years ago. She came for some ministry and as, she, as I was ministering to her, I could just see she was just covered in shame. And I knew something of her life. It hadn't been the cleanest of lifestyles. And, and I, just, I just said to her, this, this is the word that God is speaking over your life. And the word is purity. And I said, the word that God is using to define your life is purity. You see, and something shifted for her in that moment yeah. because her whole life changed. Because she remembered who she was. And I want to ask you today, who does God say you are? Do you know what God is speaking over your life? If you do, hold on to it. Hold it in front of your eyes. If you don't know, you need to go and find out. The lives of prophetic people look different because we're wearing different lenses. We're not looking at natural situations with natural eyes. But we're living with a revelation that comes from heaven and that gives us a different perspective. Yeah. You know, the prophetic has the power to unlock people's hearts. Yeah. I was the world's worst evangelist. I really wanted to do it, like I felt like I'm a believer, I wanna share Jesus with people, so I went and learned the Romans road, and I learned all those, the five things you meant to tell people to get them saved, like the creation, then you get separated, then the cross brings it back together. And I used to try and tell people, and it was so bad that I didn't even believe it myself. Like I, like, I couldn't even convince myself. I don't know what it did for them. Hopefully someone came and redeemed it. And so, like, I was really bad at it. But then I found, I found a cheat. I found a shortcut. And I realised that what God is doing that is that he's orchestrating a conversation with every unbeliever. And he knows exactly what they mean, need at this moment in time to bring them one, to reveal the ex next step of himself. And so it's so cool once I realise that I just get to say, OK, Father, what... Where are we now? What, what is the thing that is going to open this person's life up to you? And, and I was coming on a plane trip home from Brisbane and I was sitting next to a lady and I'm like, God, can you show me something for her, you know? And I, I got a picture, um, a really vague picture. It wasn't like a lightning bolt, just a vague impression of a, of a garden spade in a, in a mental picture. And I'm like, okay, worst case scenario, I totally blow it and I've got two and a half hours of embarrassment and I'll never see her again, so I can live with that. And so I said to her, do you, I said, I know this is a question, but are you interested in gardening? And she said, well, actually gardening is my hobby. She said, I've got a gardening business and I've just been to a gardening convention. And I'm going, yes, come on. <laughs> and so she said to me, how, how did you know that? And I said, well, well I'm, I said, I'm a Christian and I, and I believe that God is really interested in your life and he really wants you to know that you matter to him. And so as, as I'm saying it, I start to see a picture of her feet. So I said, do you have a problem with your feet? And she says, yeah, actually I do. I've, I've, both feet have a problem. I've had surgery in one, but I'm just waiting to have surgery in my other foot. And so I said, well, is it okay if I pray for you? And she's like, you know, so by now she's interested. And she said, yeah, sure. So as I pray for her, I can just see literally flames around her feet. And, and she said to me, my feet are just burning up. And then God starts to just download to me some emotional issues that she was going through. And so I just got to spend 45 minutes sharing the love of God with her. Very good. 
you know, I, that just started with a very vague picture of a spade and just taking a risk of looking foolish. Yeah. We were a few years ago I was in the psychic with a team in the psychic fair in Sydney, and uh, we were doing like healing and the prophetic and dream interpretation, that that kind of stuff. And this young girl came in, and I can't even remember what she came in for, but she had a radical encounter with God. And she was so excited, she, she had her boyfriend there, and she, this young man was standing watching, and she said to her boyfriend, you've got to come into the tent too. And he's like, no way, I'm not going in there. And she kept pushing and pressuring him until he came in and sat down in front of us. And I looked at him, and he was sweating, and he was shaking. I'm like, God, what's, what's the matter? And he said he is so full of shame about some of the things that he's done in his life and he's petrified that you're going to know what they are. And so I was able just to say to him, you know, God wants you to know that he will never ever expose you and he will never humiliate you and you're safe with him. And he broke. And you know what he said? He said, he said where can I find a church with people like you? And I just went, God, you know, for all these years, every time my church has had an outreach event, I've tried to invite my neighbours. And I think it's got to the point where they run and hide when they see me coming because they think I'm going to invite them to church again. But I just got your heart for someone. And he's, he's begging us for a church where he can, he can find people that reveal God like that. You know, as prophetic people, we get to call life out of death. We get to do what Ezekiel did. When God's speaking words of life, we get to speak them and we get to breathe on what God is breathing on. And that is, that is what the prophetic does in a meeting like this, is that the prophetic in a meeting like this is just looking and saying, Father, what are you opening up in the heavenly realms and what are you releasing? Because we just get to go, okay, this is what God's doing, so we all get to be a part of that. You know, we, have, we are so privileged with the worship teams we have in this church because not only do they uh, just carry a skill level in their craft, but they are a team who know how to tune into the heart of God and to release what it is that God is doing through, through their worship, through their music. And it shifts an atmosphere. That's what happened. When, when Saul was tormented with a demon, David would come and play his harp. He was a prophetic psalmist and he would just pick up the heart of God and Saul was at peace. And that is what happens with prophetic worship. When we speak in resonant agreement with what God is saying, things are broken and things are created. When, it, when our, the sounds from our mouth and the heart of God are on the same frequency, our words carry incredible power over physical matter. We, I'm just trying to use lots of examples so you can see how this stuff works because it brings it to life. We, we ran a healing rooms for many years in our church and we had this lady come in and, and she had this, this condition for three months where her heart had been racing really, really fast. And so she was, she was due to have surgery in a couple of weeks. And so she came in for prayer. And so there was a group of us praying. And I was just praying in tongues. And as I'm praying in tongues, all of a sudden, I get like this prophetic rhythm. And I remember the thought going through my head, if I say this, I'm going to look like an idiot. But I just knew the weightiness of God was on it. So I'm praying in tongues and I just start going, da da, da da, da da, da da. And as I'm doing that, she just said, oh, Alana, my heart's just slowed down. And she was totally healed from that moment. You see, I think one of the mistakes we can make when we're ministering to people is that there's almost that pressure that I've got to say something, I've got to pray something. And I think sometimes in doing that, we can, we can miss it. And I think the most important thing when you're praying for people is just to step back into your spirit, just to wait on God, maybe just pray in the spirit until we sense words that have the weightiness of God on. Because when you pray those words, they're the words that bring breakthrough right. and change and shift things. The words that come from the heart of the Father carry the divine power to see them come to pass. When you speak a prophetic word, it actually activates the grace that enables the word to perform what it says. When you receive a prophetic word, it releases the grace for you to walk in that destiny that God is speaking about. In fact, often when you receive a prophetic word, the most important thing about it isn't necessarily telling you something you don't already know. What it's doing is it's giving the ability that you can walk in that. What prophecy does, it says this is the inheritance that is available for you. When we speak prophetically, it's actually like we're creating a space in people's lives. Yeah. It's like God saying, 
this is what is available for you. This is your promised land that you get to walk in. And I've made available everything that you will ever need to walk in what I've said. And that is the activation point for us to go and start to possess the things that God has prepared for us. See, being prophetic is all about connecting with the heart of God. And I love Benny Johnson has this beautiful illustration she says um, of a heart surgeon who's doing a heart transplant and he's actually got two live hearts beating in his hands and they're both beating at a slightly different rhythm. But when he touches the hearts together, they actually synchronise so that they beat in exact, exact rhythm, exactly the same time. I love the picture of John the Apostle. You know, I read Revelation and that man had phenomenal encounters. Visitations to the throne room, revelatory downloads and yet he was the one who was the friend of Jesus and he was the one who reclined and lay his head on Jesus' chest so he could hear his heart beating. See, being prophetic is all about positioning ourselves so that we get to hear the heart of God louder than anything else around us. In many years, God spoke to me and he said this to me. He said, come and dance with me, child of mine. Come and sit at my feet, child of mine, and I will teach you the secrets of my heart. And that was an invitation that captured my heart, but it was also a challenge because I was a very busy woman. I was a mum with young children. I was working part-time. We were leading a church. I was a very, am, can be a very type A driven personality. And I had, <laughs> my husband says no. And I had no idea what it meant to stop and be still before God. And yet there was something about those words that caught my heart in a way that has never let me go. And it, and it has taken me on a journey into a lifestyle of intimacy with God that I've been on ever since. And you know, if I'm gonna be honest with you, there's times when I felt like I have just been dwelling in the presence of God for days on end. And there's been times when I've got so busy and distracted that I'm just so dry that I feel like I can't even sense God. But those words resonate with me as strongly today as they did 20 years ago. And what I'd like to do today is share a few of the things that have helped me on the journey that I've been on into intimacy with God. You know, when I, when I talk about connecting with God, I'm not saying that we're here and God's there and there's this gap that we're trying to bridge because that's not the case. The Bible's very clear that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Okay, Romans 8 says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within us. And so when I'm talking about connecting with God, I'm talking about refocusing our attention. I'm talking about shifting our attention and starting to engage and be aware of the indwelling presence of God within us. You see, God is spirit. So connecting with God is a spirit to spirit exercise. It's not an intellectual exercise. In Colossians 1.16, it says that God made two worlds. He made the heavens and the earth, and he made the visible and the invisible realms. And in Genesis 2, it says that we were made of the dust of we were made of the breath of heaven and the dust of the earth. We were created to operate in both realms. The difficulty for us is that we live in a culture where we are trained from very young to be governed by logic and reason and our intellectual senses. Paul talks about the left brain and the right brain. We are trained to tune into the left brain. You know, um, about the third, I think it was the fourth century, there was a man named Thomas, actually the 13th century, sorry. There was a man named Thomas Aquinas. He was a very, very influential man in the church. Up until that point, all of these things, spiritual experiences, dreams, encounters with God were normal Christian life. And what Thomas Aquinas did is he embraced the teachings of the Greek philosopher Aristotle. And what those teachings say is that anything that you cannot understand and explain through logic and intellect and reasoning has to be disregarded. And those teachings permeated through the church over the next few centuries to the point that the last four centuries, by and large, much of the church has operated in, in a cerebral, intellectual knowing about God and has totally lost that whole experiential understanding of Very God. Good. That reason and logic have been so elevated that as a culture, we have lost the awareness of the spiritual realm. It's different in other cultures. 
we see well with our natural eyes, but we haven't necessarily developed the ability to see with our spiritual eyes into the spiritual realm. You know, God is communing us with us all the time. That's not the issue. But often we are just so busy and distracted with our life or so <laughs> distracted by the voice in our head that we're just not aware of what he's saying. We haven't developed awareness of our spiritual senses. And we can operate on a natural frequency or we can operate on a supernatural frequency. And engaging with God is about tuning in to a different frequency into the spirit realm. It's no different from a radio. You can have um, music playing on a channel in the radio, for those of you that are old enough to know what radios are, <laughs> like me. It's on your laptop, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> but you know, on the radio, if you have a radio in your car, if you don't tune in, you're just going to get static. And it's exactly the same deal. Okay? The whole thing of spiritual awareness is about learning to tune in. It's not a question of whether God is speaking or if it's present. It's about shifting our focus. And I believe that intimacy with God is something of a lost art to many believers today. It just kind of becomes another thing on the to-do list. And I was doing a little mini sozo on myself a little while ago, and God just showed me this picture. He said, Alona, he said, this is how you see intimacy with God when you get busy. And he showed me this picture of him. It's a big ogre, a bit like Jack and the Beanstalk, with his knife and fork banging on the table. Where's my food? You know, where, come and serve my food. He said, that's how you see it sometimes when you get busy. He said, but this is how I see it. And he showed me a picture of me in this exquisite French restaurant with just like this most amazing food. And, and he was my waiter with a towel over his arm and this beautiful bottle of wine and just serving up the most amazing food. And you see, when I'm not living out of that place, I sometimes forget what it's like. But when I'm in that place, like there is nowhere else that I would rather be. David talked about dwelling in the secret place. He said, my soul waits in silence for God only. And I think that most of us are not that great at waiting. We kind of develop pretty short attention spans in this whole microwave culture. We're not so great at the whole marinating. I know that if I have to wait more than 10 seconds for my internet to connect, I'm getting pretty edgy. <laughs> Does anyone here find it easy to wait and be still? There may be some of you that do because you develop that in your life. Not only are we surrounded by many competing voices and demands all clamouring for our attention, we've all got that internal conversation going on in our heads as well. But God says to me nearly every day of my life, he says, be still and know that I am God. You know, stillness isn't just about getting somewhere quiet, although that's helpful. It's about learning to be still on the inside. And I love what the prophet Habakkuk has to say in chapter 2 at the beginning. And I've taken this for my life. And he says, he says, I will stand at my watch and I will station myself on the tower and I will look to see what he will say to me. That word stand, I will stand at my watch, means to abide, to dwell, to be present, to remain. Habakkuk did two things. The first thing that he did is he actually made space in his life. He had a place where he went to, where he could actually get away from all the other things and just be alone with God and quiet himself. And I remember a few years ago, Steve and I were in a very busy time of ministry and we actually went away for five days to the Grampians. And we got this beautiful little romantic cottage and all we did is we just walked and we ate dinner and we just spent time together. And I remember by about day three, without we hadn't got the children, we hadn't got our phones, we hadn't got all the distractions. By about day three, I suddenly was so much more aware of what was happening for Steve, of what he was thinking, how he was feeling. I was just picking up all the subtle cues that I'd been missing in the busyness of life. And you see, that's what waiting on God is like. It's actually giving ourselves time and space to be in communion with him. And I want to say this, it requires discipline and it requires intention to shut the door on all the other things that are shouting at us in life. I actually think it's one of the most violent things you'll ever do in your life, is to wrestle down all those things in your diary and all those demands to consistently carve out space to be with God. 
And I've heard the phrase used, the battle for intimacy, and I understand that phrase because it's not a battle from God's perspective. He's not distant or difficult to connect with. But you see, the enemy is not silly. And I find in my life, it's not, it's not bad things that keep me distracted from God. It's actually good things. It's all the good things. And, and they're the things most often that crowd us out so we actually can't be with God. And the thing I love about Jesus is that Jesus always prioritised solitude and silence with God, no matter what the demands on him. You know, I often think there must have been villages that he didn't get to visit that were full of demonised and sick people that probably died because he didn't go there. But he still prioritised times of silence and solitude alone with God. It is really helpful to find a place and a time where you can be alone with God away from your external circumstances. It's, it's not a formula. I mean, for me, God spoke to me years ago. It has to be early in the morning because once my head gets going, I'm, you know, I'm cactus. So I need to get up before my family, before the day. For Steve, it's time in the bush. He'll go and walk for hours in the bush and connect with God. I remember asking Izzy, did you see me once? Um, I know she always just makes space in her time space in her life and she had six kids she was homeschooling she had a baby and I said Izzy how do you how do you consistently do this and she said well I just get up at two o'clock in the morning because everyone else is asleep you know who's heard of Susanna Wesley she's the mother of John Wesley she had I think 16 or 17 children and she trained her kids that when mummy has the apron over her head you don't come and disturb I don't know what it is for you maybe it's in your car on the way to work Maybe it's last thing in the day, but I would say, ask God, how do I get to establish this pattern in my life? Very good. The second thing that Habakkuk did is that he stilled himself before the Lord so that he could look and see. So he knew how to refocus. He knew how to tune into the realm of the spirit so that his spiritual senses were switched on and alert. Much of engaging with God is about internal posturing. Because stillness releases a capacity in us to engage with God at a much deeper level. And being still is not a passive thing. Okay? It requires us to be very, very intentional to deal with that eternal chaos that is going on, the racing thoughts, the head going berserk about all the things you've got to do, and often emotions which are in turmoil. And it's not something that can be hurried or forced, because I'm not talking about a quiet time. Please understand that. I'm talking about an internal life that is given space and allowed to grow and develop. There's a, there's a wonderful phrase in church history that comes to us from the Quakers, and they call it centering down. It means to recognise the centre of quiet within each one of us where the Holy Spirit dwells, to turn our inward gaze upon God, just to tune in, to be present with God so that we're aware of him. And I just begin, you know, by turning my affection on him. Like sometimes it's listening to worship. Sometimes I might just meditate on a verse with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I'm just praying in tongues gently. Or sometimes I'm just saying, Jesus, you're amazing. Jesus, you're amazing. Jesus, I love you. You're incredible. And I'm just focusing on the indwelling presence. And, you know, it takes time and it takes practice to learn to quiet our minds. When I first began, it was really difficult. It would be something like this, Jesus, you're amazing. Jesus, you're amazing. Oh my goodness, I forgot to get the meat out of the freezer for dinner. Oh my goodness, I better go to the shops and what do I need? Oh, and oh no, I've got to, re oh, sorry. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, you're amazing. Oh, I really feel like a cup of tea. <laughs> what does Facebook say? <laughs> okay. Our minds are so used to having their own way that it takes time to bring them under discipline. And, and you know what else I find is, you know, the more I spend time in that place and get accustomed to dwelling there, it gets really easy. And then I'll get really busy and distracted. And all of a sudden, I find it difficult again. And God actually said to me, he said, it's like when you get all focused on these other things. It's almost like a crust develops. You build a crust over that inner place. And I find, just being real, because I, I don't want you to get discouraged. I find when I, when I go, no, I'm just resetting the clock, I'm coming back to that place, it might take me a few days to get back to that place where I easily sense him again. 
okay? But as you intentionally focus on him, you become aware of a listening stillness. And there's a point where all of a sudden, it's like something deep inside has been awakened. And you become more aware of the gentle movements of God, of the spiritual realm, and you sense God, and that awareness is greater. The awareness of the spiritual realm becomes greater than the awareness of what else is happening. And that is what John talked about in Revelation 1 when he said, I was in the spirit. Yeah. It's talking about I'm in that place where I'm so tuned into God. I'm so tuned into the spirit that I'm not even aware of what's going on around because I'm totally focused, I'm totally engaged yeah. with God. And that is the place where we start to become aware from thoughts that come from the heart of God. That is the place where we start to get pictures and visions that come from God and revelatory downloads and insights and, and light bulb moments and where we have those encounters with God. I remember once just being in that place with God and all of a sudden it was just like I was standing on the top of a mountain. I could actually feel the cold breeze, the clear air. They, they are the moments. They are the moments with God. You see... Often what happens is we can miss the voice of God because it's so simple. God communicates spirit to spirit, but he uses the vehicles of our mind and our body and emotions creatively to speak to us. And we can miss that if we're not looking for it. Because that's what happened to Samuel. He was a prophet in the Old Testament, but as a child he heard the audible voice of God and he, didn't, he missed it. He didn't recognise it was God. He thought it was Eli the priest. And it wasn't until Eli spoke to him that he realised. And so, so what happens is very often we're sensing God and we're not recognising what we are sensing. And so it's really, really important in this place to start notice what you are sensing, that you, you find out how you are wired yeah. and how you sense the spiritual realm because that is going to be different for every single one of you. Yeah. I remember early on in the piece, I had been praying for someone for about three months to get healed. And I was just in this place with God and all of a sudden I had this picture in my mind of the person wrapped up in green yarn. And to be very honest, I did not know whether it was my own mind or whether it was God showing me something. And I went, well, God, you're kind. You're not going to be mad with me if I have a go and I get it wrong. So I just started praying into this picture of the person wrapped in the green yarn. And as I prayed for a couple of minutes, I saw the yarn fall off them and the person was 100% healed. And you see, so I learned something that day. I realised, wow, that was God. That wasn't me. I learned that when I'm ministering to people, if I start to have the sensation that my head is spinning, not spinning, but spinning inside, that they've been involved in witchcraft, you see. And I've learned that God showed me that because then it makes it very, very easy for me to know how to minister to them and for them to get set free. You know, I remember being in a cafe one day with some friends in Mount Gambia and I'd asked God that morning, I said, God, I want, I want you to show me something for the waitress who serves us. And I, and I was asking for names at that point. I wanted God to give me names. And so this waitress was serving us and I said, God, what's her name? And, and in my head, I got this name, Teresa. And so I was going to ask her and, and I was just sitting waiting with the presence of God and all of a sudden I get this name that rises from deep down with the peace of God on it and the name was Amanda. And it felt really different. And when she came back, we asked her what her name was and it was Mandy. And you see, I learned something that day because I learned what it felt like when God spoke to me, that it came out of the depths of my being and it was different from the other name that I'd heard. So I started to understand what the difference was. I started to recognise. I work as a counsellor and I've realised that when I'm sitting with people, as I start to see things in my mind and feel things, that God's allowing me to see and feel what they feel so I know what they need in that minute. I start to ask questions. I, I, I remember, um, you know, the other thing that happens is sometimes other people help confirm for us what God is doing. I remember being in a meeting and Jason Brook was there and... <laughs> and um, I was in this meeting and the sense was... I love Jason. He's been such an amazing encouragement to me and help. I've learned so much from his encouragement. And um, in this meeting, the sense to me was that there was an angelic presence here to my left. But I'm like, God, it's, I'm not sure if I'm imagining it or if it's you. And Jason gave up, came up to me at the end of the meeting and he said, Alona, I saw an angel standing to the left of you. 
you see. And so you go on this journey and you, you need to ask questions, you need to notice and you, you need to explore and that's God, is this you? What does it look like? Because God is wanting to open up your senses, okay? And he's wanting to, he's wanting to use them so that he can communicate with him. The more aware that we become of him, the gentler his voice becomes. The more that we listen, the easier it becomes, not just to hear him speak, but it's like you start to recognise the very slightest nuances and highlights and ebbs and flows and gentle whispers. So you don't have to have that shouting voice. It's actually like you suddenly sense the slightest shift in the atmosphere or change. You're like, God, what, what are you doing? You're on that. You sense the weightiness of God. And so, so we need to start observing those things and, and just leaning into them. You know, when you spend t- a lot of time with someone, their voice becomes very familiar how many of your parents have been in that situation where you've been in the room full of noisy, screaming, yelling kids and you hear that one cry and you know. You know your own child. So the deeper you go into this kind of intimacy and God consciousness, the easier it becomes to be sensitive to his voice and his presence in everyday life. God said to me, he said, get to know my fragrance in the secret place and then you'll recognise it out there. And so I find that there's times when, I, when I'm out there and all of a sudden I just know it's there. I just recognise that, that presence. And I know that whatever I'm, whatever's happening, if it's a hand that needs to be healed, I know it's going to get healed. I know whatever it is that God's doing something. It's like, hey, God, I can sense your presence. What are you up to? Because I know I get to be part of it and that's really exciting. And God said to me, he said, Alona, I want you to step back into the spirit realm a few times a day. Just step back into that place because I want you to learn to abide in my presence. I want you to learn to dwell in that place. And the question that he's been asking me consistently over the last few weeks is, Alona, where are you living out of? What are you operating out of? And that that is the question, Gateway, that I, I actually have for every one of you today, that I feel the question of God for you is where are you living out of? The picture that I got last week was of us in a golden river. And the picture I got was that we were on tippy toes, and this is for me as well as for everyone else, with our heads up like this, because we just wanted to touch the ground and still breathe. But God was saying it's actually time now. It's that time to let go. That, that, it's the time to move away from self-reliance, because it's that place where we go out into the middle of the river. And, and as I went back to my seat after sharing that word, I suddenly felt what it was like to let go. And I was floating in the most peaceful, beautiful place possible. And I feel like... God wants to establish such a deep hunger in us for the prophetic. And it's not that we don't have a deep deposit of the prophetic, because we actually do, but there is so much more. And hunger is a key. A hunger is a key to being a prophetic people, a prophetic community. That's why Paul says, eagerly desire the prophetic. When I sense my hunger waning, that's the time I know I need to go and talk to people who are going to inspire me. I need to go and find Heidi Baker on YouTube or whatever it takes, wherever it is that you are now, God is wanting to take you into something more. This is an invitation for each and every one of you. Joe, for you, I just feel like that there's such a depth of the prophetic coming for you. That I just saw it again this morning, but I know that the prophetic, you already operated it, but I just feel like the deepness, the depth that's coming for you, that God's just opened up right now for you to start walking in. It's, It's just right there. And so today, wherever you are at, for some of you, it's going to be like God's going to open up your senses. I feel like there's a whole, the whole creativeness of the senses that God's going to start using all the different, uh, different aspects of who you are. And you just start taking notice because things are going to happen that haven't happened before. Unusual occurrences, like, like you're going to notice things in your body and your skin and your feelings. And when that happens, you need to just step back and ask God the questions. God, what's happening? What are you? He's going to teach you. He's like he's rewiring you and he's putting a new voltage through the wires. So you're going to start sensing things and you need to ask God questions because it's not just a coincidence and it's not just natural, it's God. So start paying attention to all the new things that start happening because God wants to take you on a journey. I know, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I know that dreams are going to get unlocked for you because it always does. It's one of the things I carry. And so for some of you, you haven't really dreamt before. But dreams are going to start unlocking. You're going to start dreaming. And and it's not going to make sense. Because the thing about dreams is 
they're symbolic and they're, an, they're a mystery and they're an invitation deeper into relationship with God. And there's a whole, that's a whole other message on how do we understand and interpret dreams. But the dream realm is going to unlock for you. And I want to say to you, even though it won't make sense, it's God. And there's a journey for you to go on. And then the, the revelatory realms are going to open up more. There's been such a deep deposit in this church that God wants to bring a return on. And so for some of you, you're already operating quite deeply in the revelatory realms, but God is going to open up new dimensions. And Paul, that's for you, especially on, for like God said that, the revelatory realms that you're in, but there's whole new dimensions that are going to just open up for you. But all of these words that I say, there's an inheritance for this people as a church. Okay. That to be a prophetic community where every single believer wherever you are now, that God's opened, I've, God has opened up a space. I just want to prophesy over you. There was a space opened up for you to step into the more, whatever it is. And so, Gateway, I, I, if it's okay, I just want to pray for you. So, Father, I thank you for this stunning, beautiful people, for this church called Gateway that you have ordained, Lord. And Father, I pray for an unlocking and an activation and a release. Father. Oh, Father, I just... I just even to sense, that, Father, I just sense even the angelic presence in this room at the moment for what you wanted to unlock. So, Father, I pray that you just, you just unlock things, you activate things that haven't happened before, that there will be a, 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 the water table of the prophetic in this church will deepen, will increase, Lord God, that people, there's just, they're just, from wherever they are now, Lord God, it's just like they're going to go a whole lot deeper, Father, and there's a whole lot more that you're unveiling. And so, Father, remove the veils. And as you did for Gehazi, open our eyes that we may see, Lord God. Open our eyes to see into the, into the dimensions and the realms that we have not yet seen, Father. For your glory, Lord God, and for you, what you want to do through us as a people. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.